Unit 6, Section 2, Making Compost. Well, regardless of the composter that you use to make compost, a few things are necessary to actually produce compost. One is organic matter of the proper types. Two is heat. The heat is usually, in a traditional composter, a drum or a bin, that type of composter, supplied by the microbial action rather than an external source. Um, kind of hard to imagine, but you have all these single cell bacteria um, working away on the organic matter, decomposing it, and their body heat can raise the internal temperature of compost uh, to well over 110, 120 degrees. The next thing you need is oxygen, which is supplied by aerating the compost or turning the compost over um, either in a bin with a shovel or a spading fork or else uh, in a tumbler type, um, some method of turning the compost over. Moisture, because the Decomposing organisms, fungi and bacteria, require a moist environment. Let's take a quick look at each of these and how it's, what's necessary and uh, what uh, variations and components. Uh, for instance, organic matter. Anything that's organic can be composted. Though usually meat and dairy products are generally not composted because they can attract pests. It's possible to do it. It's just that it, it can cause some odor and it can and it can attract press, uh, pests. So usually when we're talking about composting, we're talking about plant material as the organic matter. And that is divided into two classes called greens and browns. That's commonly referred to as greens and browns. The names refer to the content of the organic matter, as well as very generally to the color. Greens are high in nitrogen. Browns are high in carbon. And it's important to have both greens and browns and in the right ratio to get composting to happen at maximum speed. Why is that? It's because of something called the CN or carbon nitrogen ratio. The microbes that do the composting have bodies made with specific ratios of carbon to nitrogen. Okay, so bacteria contain so much carbon and so much nitrogen. And all of the bacteria of that species has the same amount of carbon and the same amount of nitrogen or the same ratio of carbon and nitrogen in the cell. So when they eat or start decomposing the organic matter, they require food that has a carbon to nitrogen ratio that's close to the ratio in their body. If the compost has too much nitrogen, the microbes will break down the compost until they've used all the carbon, at which point further composition slows dramatically since they're not getting the carbon that they need from what's left. It's mostly just nitrogen. The uh, composting can still happen because some carbon will be supplied from the bacteria themselves dying and their bodies being used uh, as a carbon source for breaking it down, but the, the, it slows dramatically. Now, an ideal ratio of carbon to nitrogen is 25 to 1 to 30 to 1. Now, that doesn't mean that you need 25 parts of brown to 25 parts of green. I'll explain that. This ratio can be achieved by using the proper amounts of each type of organic matter. We're going to look at a couple of charts here. Here we see the average carbon to nitrogen ratio of common browns. Okay, first is sawdust. 400 or 500 to 1 carbon to nitrogen ratio. So sawdust itself would decompose actually quite slowly if it didn't have other things mixed with it. 
wood chips, which is essentially just bigger pieces of sawdust, about the same ratio. Cardboard, 350 to 1. Newspaper, 175 to 1. Pine needles, 80 to 1. Straw, 75 to 1. And dried leaves, 60 to 1. Now look at this next chart. These are some common greens that might be used in composting. Chicken manure, seven to one. So in this case, the previous chart showed us things with way too much carbon. Now we're looking at something that has way too little carbon. Other manures, 15 to one maybe. Coffee grounds, 20 to one. That's pretty close to the ratio that we're looking for. Grass clippings, 20 to one. Vegetable scraps, 25 to one. And green leaves and garden waste, about 30 to one. These last two are pretty close to what we want as the ideal mix. But you can throw in all of these other things provided that you then add some browns. Now remember I said that you have this ratio of 25 or 30 to 1, but it doesn't mean, say, adding 25 or 30 cups of browns to one cup of green. Now the nitrogen component of the greens is much less. There's much less nitrogen in, say, um, a gallon of greens than there would be carbon in a gallon of common browns. So the actual ratio of mixing uh, greens to browns in volume is uh, much less. Probably three times three cups of greens, for instance, for every cup of browns. Here we see some materials in a compost bin, and you can make out uh, banana peels and some lettuce, some of this stuff has decomposed even further um, and is starting to become unidentifiable. We have some eggshells. Those are probably not going to be broken down very well in the composting process, um, but can still be thrown in and can be mixed on the garden. So as a rule of thumb, if you use two to three parts by volume of greens to one part brown, this is by weight, but by volume seems to work about the same. Um, you should have a decent mix for composting. But what happens if it's wrong? What if you don't have access to the browns that you need or uh, for some reason your mix is wrong? Well, it's not the end of the world. Um, composting is still going to happen. It's just going to happen much more slowly. And then if the compost material contains far too much nitrogen, um, you can get an unpleasant odor developing. Having the ratio right keeps the odor almost non-existent and makes this uh, process happen much more quickly. Next, heat. Compost can get quite hot. The ideal temperature for microbial activity is about 130 degrees, somewhere between 115, 135 degrees um, a lot of composting can be taking place when uh, temperatures get to that point. Um, in a proper mix of materials, the microbes themselves will heat the compost, raising its temperature to that. Having the compost, having a composter, uh, either a bin or a tumbler, which is made of black material, will add heat. Uh, when the sunlight falls on it, allowing the compost process to start sooner in the spring and go later in the fall and go at full speed even on cooler days. Oxygen. Composting is an aerobic process. The microbes doing the work require oxygen. Lack of oxygen can result from compost that isn't being turned or aerated or from too much moisture. If a pile goes anaerobic, real composting stops and fermentation begins. That can result in very bad odors and sloppy, messy goop rather than nice, fluffy compost. The answer is to control the moisture 
and aerate often to make sure that the oxygen is there. Moisture, bacteria and fungi that do the composting are decomposing the materials, require moisture to live and do their jobs. Too much moisture will cause problems by making the compost anaerobic. It keeps the oxygen out. Too little moisture stops composting because the microbes go dormant when uh, there isn't enough moisture around. So the compost needs to be kept evenly moist, but not wet. Here again is a uh, shot of some materials in a compost bin. Here you see a uh, sort of a scoop device for turning the compost. Here's another device that can be pushed into the compost, have the handle pull and spread it. This allows it to be mixed. And notice also that the outside of this composter is a dark color, which will aid in getting heat coming in. <clears throat> so how quickly can compost be made? Well, much depends on the outside temperature. And as we talked about the mix of materials being composted, the moisture, and how well aerated it is. If conditions are good, using a tumbler type composter, one can have finished compost in six weeks or even less. This means it is possible to make several batches of compost during a growing season. Here we see the uh, bin type composter that we looked at earlier with the door lifted partially up. And down here at the bottom, you can see finished compost. It's a uh, dark, nearly black in color, fine granular texture. This is really well composted material down here. You can still see a few of the you know, larger pieces in there, but that's fine. Doing it in a bin like this, turning it regularly, you can probably still make compost in six to eight weeks. Using multiple composters. As I mentioned before, you really need two separate containers. One for adding new materials and one for finishing. Um, you start with two bins, add materials to one, aerating it regularly until it's full. At that point, you stop adding new materials to the bin and begin adding materials to the second bin, but you still keep aerating the first bin on a regular basis. The idea being that by the time we have filled the second bin up, the first bin will be finished and we can remove that compost, start using that first bin again to add new material and let the second bin cook. Sometimes it's uh, better and easier to have multiple bins since the timing of finishing the compost versus adding new materials doesn't always work out perfectly. So it's uh, not unheard of to have three or four or five bins such as this, where we can be adding material to one, we can be letting another one finish. If this one isn't finished, by the time this one's full, we can add material to this one. So, and there's yet another one down on the far end. Compost issues. Well, properly maintained, composting generates, generates virtually no odor and produces a valuable product. So it doesn't have many issues if it's properly done. However, if it becomes anaerobic, it can get to be quite smelly and quite messy. It becomes anaerobic by allowing too much moisture in or by not aerating it sufficiently. Compost in the early stages can also attract insects such as fruit flies. And this is true regardless of how well the compost pile is maintained, um, as the fresh material being thrown in can be attractive to those uh, insects. But once the process is underway, we've decided to let that one rest and start filling up a second bin, um, the insects usually go away and don't bother it. Um, 
And finally, as we mentioned, meat and dairy products can be composted just as well as plant material. But doing so is likely to attract pests like skunks, raccoons, possums, mice, rats, etc. So typically, that's not done. So now that we've made our compost, how do we use our compost? Well, it can be added to any soil to improve its structure and to add nutrients. And unlike other forms of fertilizer, finished compost will not cause fertilizer burn, so it can be added at any time to the plants, to the soil. Compost can be used as a top dressing or as a mulch, or it can be mixed into the soil. Compost can be stored for long periods of time for later use. And then water can be added to finished compost and collected when it runs through, creating something called compost tea. Compost tea is made by steeping finished compost in water and then draining the water. It can be sprayed on plants to suppress foliar diseases. It can actually help reduce instances of uh, foliar fungal diseases, black spot, um, powdery mildew, things like that. Compost tea can be used as a soil drench to help suppress fungal root diseases and increase the amount of nutrients in the soil that are immediately available without any further breaking down. Sort of a valuable product. And another way to compost. So we looked at creating a compost pile or using a tumbler, adding materials, aerating it, and that sort of thing to create compost. But there is another way, um, and that's worm composting. Worm composting, as the name suggests, uses worms to break down organic matter. Bacteria and fungi still aid the process by beginning the process of breaking down the organic matter. So when you add organic matter to uh, a worm composting unit, fungi and bacteria start operating on it first. It breaks it down a little bit, and then the worms uh, start chewing through it. The worms then consume that organic matter, digest it, and excrete it as something called worm castings, which is the finished product of worm composting. In addition, the worms themselves may also be a saleable product. You can sell worms to fishermen. You can sell worms to people who might want to put them in their garden, or you can sell worms to people who might want to do worm composting. Worm composting can be done in almost any type of container, such as an old dresser drawer or a large plastic tray with holes filled in the bottom. But if done indoors, a waterproof container is placed underneath to contain any water that drips out. Usually the organic matter that we're adding, um, the plant debris, uh, contains a lot of water. And as it's being broken down by the fungi and bacteria and then by the worms, this water comes out and can drip through the material. So some sort of waterproof container underneath helps hold that water. Bedding often shredded newspaper is placed in the container and moistened, not soaking wet, but moist. Then worms are added and then organic matter is buried in the bedding. The bacteria and fungi, as we mentioned, first act on the organic matter and then the worms consume the material, including the bedding, reducing it to castings. This slide shows a worm compost bin and in the bottom, there's uh, you know, crumpled up and shredded paper and that sort of thing. And the worms are living in there. And then uh, and you can see, I think, a little bit right here. You can see one of the worms. Um, and then organic matter is added, and the worms will consume it. So how do you harvest this worm compost? Well, since the worms are mixed throughout the material, the har uh, harvesting can be a little bit of a chore since the worms should be separated from the casting. You don't want to get rid of all your worms as you're taking the castings out to use on a garden. Um, so some more advanced uh, 
commercially available worm composters have bins that can be stacked. So you take the start with the bottom bin, which sits over a uh, waterproof container, add the bedding material, add the um, worms, add the organic material, and the worms will start consuming that material. And you can add more bedding and more uh, organic matter until you're close to the top of the of the tray, right up near the very top of that tray. Then you put a second tray on top, add bedding and organic matter to that, and the worms will migrate up into the bin with fresh bedding and fresh organic matter and start working on that. After a couple of days, most of the worms will be up in the top. Take that off, remove the bottom bin because it's full of castings now. There will still be a few worms in it, but most of them will be in top. Put the top bin back on your waterproof container and take the other bin outside where to your garden or wherever you're going to use it. Um, worm composting uh, really can be done in four to 12 weeks, about the same time, a little faster to about the same time as traditional composting. Here we see another shot of the uh, worm compost bin. And here you can see at this point, there's a lot more uh, worm castings and less bedding. And uh, some new bedding has been added. And notice that it's just moist, not wet. Um, the fine brown castings are the finished product, but that batch still has a ways to go. So that's an alternative method of doing composting um, in addition to the more traditional methods. And that is the end of this unit.